that we may behold wonderful things from your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Master, our all. Amen. In Philippians chapter 2, we read this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the text. In the name of Jesus, treasured brothers and sisters of the Our Savior's Lutheran Church family, a great spiritual movement has come over our Western society. Not of Christianity, but of non-Christian paganism. People say they are spiritual, not Christian. And this vague, amorphous spiritualism is leading our society down bizarre paths where evil is considered good and good is considered evil. A moral society needs the foundation, and that foundation has been our Christian faith, where we have faith preceding works. A fundamental creed, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, says Proverbs. So just as a horse comes before the wagon, so faith has to precede works. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. So this morning, we study that foundation as we move into the second article of the Apostles' Creed in our sermon series. This is what we believe about that most unique person that the world has ever seen, the person of Jesus Christ, true God and true man. I believe in Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Now, St. Paul refers to the humiliation of Christ in the text, which I just read, and he makes two very important points. One, Christ is God, and secondly, this eternal God became man, and he took on himself the form of a servant and was born in the likeness of man. And even more, he was obedient, even to death, and that shameful death on the cross, on top of it all. In our confirmation instruction, we picture this humiliation of Christ as a stairway downwards with five steps. The stairway reaches all the way from heaven to death and the tomb. So this morning, let's follow Christ as he goes down these five humiliated steps and learn a very important lesson from this section of Philippians this morning. Step number one, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now, Ordinarily, it takes two human beings, male and female, to bring about the beginning of new life, which we call conception. No virgin, unmarried woman ever becomes pregnant. Parthenogenesis, the reproduction through one single sex, is known among insects and among worms and among algae, but it does not happen among human beings. So, the conception of Christ obviously involved a miracle. The angel had said to the Virgin Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, even though this was a miracle, Christ's conception in the womb of a woman was his first step down the ladder of humiliation. Remember, he was a creator, and he now becomes part of a creature, a creature, 
Mary, Christ who created all the vastness and light years of space becomes confined in the womb connected with the umbilical cord to Mary. Now what humiliation, a huge limitation of his godly being. Step number two, he was born of the Virgin Mary. No other event in history has produced half the number of hymns and carols and dramas and paintings and poems as had the birth of Jesus Christ. Weeks before Christmas, Christmas carols fill the air. Christmas Eve programs every year retell the marvelous story. Caesar Augustus issues a decree that all should be enrolled and Mary and Joseph arrive from Nazareth as obedient citizens. And as they get to Nazareth, all the houses and the inns are filled. And so Mary gives birth to her first baby in a stable, a barn, lays him in the manger, and calls him Jesus. Artists have pictured this event in such color and beauty, and we think about it with such joy that we almost forget that for Christ, this was another step in his humiliation. The God of the universe becomes an infant speck on the face of an insignificant planet in the Milky Way galaxy. And there are billions of galaxies out there that he created. When communists took control of China, thousands of Chinese who wanted freedom fled to Hong Kong for protection. In one year, the population doubled. It was worse than Bethlehem at the time of Christ's birth because all of these refugees came to stay. People slept in garages, under steps, or any place that they could find some kind of shelter. There were shanties on the hillside all tacked together of plywood and cardboard and discarded pieces of tin. No running water or toilets of any kind. In country after country, this kind of refugee situation has been repeated from the boat people of Indochina, refugees from Pakistan and Afghanistan, refugees fleeing from Sudan and Cuba and Syria, Christians fleeing persecution and genocide in the Middle East, the invasion over the southern borders of the USA and Canada. It happens again and again and again. Now the exchange that our Savior made was far greater and much more traumatic even than those horrible situations. Christ, who is spirit, became flesh. Christ, who is God, took on human form. Christ, who lived in heaven and came down to this torn and blasted and bleeding world, he came as an insignificant little baby in the middle of nowhere. Christ, who lived in internal mansions, was born in a stinking barn in the simple culture of Palestine centuries before, centuries before our modern style of life and centuries before all of the modern creature comforts that many of us now enjoy. He had none of it. Step number three, Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. Now that's a very short sentence, but what a long step down the ladder in Christ's humiliation. Of course, Christ suffered long before he ever saw the governor. On the eighth day, he shed his first blood as he was circumcised. When Herod threatened to kill all newborn children, especially this newborn king, Joseph had to take him off on a difficult trip to Egypt. They were refugees themselves. As a boy in Nazareth, other children probably ridiculed him as the Holy One, holier than thou. Forty days and forty nights without food or drink in the wilderness was certainly no picnic. Christ once summarized his life 
when he explained, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But this is only the beginning of the agony and suffering that he endured. It continued under Pontius Pilate, the capture in the garden, the humiliation of false charges, and being called a liar and a blasphemer, the crown of thorns, the mockery, the blindfolding, the jeers thrown at him, if you are the Son of God, tell us who hit you. The spit in the face, and his hands were tied, and words was yet to come. Stripped, he was beaten mercilessly with a Roman whip with those pieces of lead and bone tied into those leather thongs. And the movie Passion of Christ depicted this whipping so realistically that shocked people so much that they had to avert their gaze, make people sick. Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, who could have destroyed them all with one word, patiently endured their brutality. What humiliation. Step number four, they crucified him. Now crucifixion, under the Romans would reserve for slaves and hardened criminals because of the shame and cruelty of it all. The Venetians had invented this diabolical, gruesome capital punishment 600 years before Christ. This is very interesting too, because if you read in Psalm 22, they pierce his hands and his feet. That was written by David a thousand years before Christ, and it was only 400 years later that they began to pierce hands and feet in crucifixion. Fascinating. Fascinating. To please the mob, Pilate ordered our Lord to be crucified. They compelled him to carry his own cross down the narrow streets of Jerusalem, and after stretching out his arms and legs, they took those eight-inch long square nails, and they transfixed his arms and his legs by these nails, to the wood of the cross, and then lifted it up and dropped it into the socket in the ground and left him there to die. Then the jeer, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. What humiliation. Step number five. He died and is buried. After six hours of agony on the cross, our Savior cried, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head and he died. He was truly dead. Before the soldiers took his body from the cross, they pierced his side with a spear just to make sure that the death sentence had really been carried out. He who had created all life and he could honestly say, I am the resurrection and the life, was dead. What? Humiliation. But even in the middle of all of the hate and the confusion, there were a few who still loved him and had the courage to admit it. And so it was that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came forward, asked for the body, wrapped it in linen and spices, and quickly laid it in Joseph's tomb and rolled a stone in front of the entrance. There was no funeral service. There was no procession. There was no tolling of bells. No one was there to speak a eulogy. This was the final step down the ladder of humiliation. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He had reached the end of this ladder of humiliation. Why did Christ humble himself? in this degrading way? That's the key question, because the answer gives Christ's humiliation meaning for our lives, gives us a moral foundation for us to stand on, gives us hope, gives us forgiveness, gives us life, gives us the resurrection and eternal life in heaven. Through his humiliation, Christ bought the world back from hopelessness of lawlessness and chaos. And this wasn't some kind of publicity stunt by a neurotic person. 
And Christ wasn't the victim of circumstances beyond his control, as some would suggest. This humiliation was part of God's own eternal plan. So his humiliation wasn't a defeat, but the fulfillment of his own plan to redeem the world. St. Paul put it in very plain language. He died for all. His very name, Jesus, means the Lord saves. That's why we go to all of the trouble of building colleges and seminaries for training pastors and teachers and deaconesses and missionaries. That's why we pray thy kingdom come often in this mission petition of the Lord's Prayer. That's why we establish our Savior's Lutheran Church here in Chatham. That's why we plant new churches. We call pastors. We teach the scriptures to others. We witness to our friends. We come to church and we bring others with us. Christ died for all. Every man and woman and child, the white and the black, the red, the yellow, the good people and the bad, all who are sinners. And that is everybody. That's everybody have been redeemed through Christ's awful humiliation. But the most important thing is Christ has redeemed me. During the Lenten season, when we come into church, the bare trunk of a tree has been stripped and formed into a cross and placed here in the chancel area and purple and black cloths are placed over it. And when people enter church, immediately they are reminded of the agony of Christ's suffering and death on the cross. And this is good if it reminds me that Jesus died for me. Then you have the true meaning of Christ's humiliation. Believe it, he died for you. He stooped to that degradation out of complete love for you, agape love, divine love. Through his humiliation, he had redeemed me from sin and death and the power of the devil. And we all know what sin is. It's rebellion against God. A guilty conscience, fear, doubt, that nagging feeling telling us every day that things are not really the way they should be. But because of Christ's humiliation, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You can sing his praises. You can walk tall before him. Your sins are forgiven. And he gives you the power to get up and sin no more through the forgiveness that he offers. About 780 people die in our country every day. We know we deserve death. The fact that we're living right now is more than we deserve. St. Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. But he quickly adds, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why when a loved one dies in our Lord, we don't have to mourn as a heathen do who have no hope. That's why we can face death without fear and say, oh death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Another member of the church was in hospital and once said, ah, it's going to be a great day. And Pastor Wendy said, what's that all about? And he said, well, well, it's going to be a good, great day. And she replied with a smile on her face, well, when I die. Now she knew that Christ had abolished death, so that death for a Christian is the beginning of real life without fear or doubt or worry, or pain, or any of those ills that plague us now in this world in which we are living. It's a cartoon which pictures two saints complete with wings and halos taking a rest on a cloud in heavenly bliss. And the one turns to the other and says, ha, if it hadn't been for all those healthy foods, we could have been up here years ago. Well, how beautifully that captures the mixed feelings of St. Paul who said, 
For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It helps to redeem us from the power of the devil. Make no mistake, Satan is absolutely alive and active on earth today. Just go ahead and read the daily news. But Christ has crushed the power of the devil for the believer. Luther once told his people, when the devil says to me, Luther, you are a great sinner, I have to answer him, you are right. But when he adds, because of your sins, you're going to hell, I just laugh at him and say, you, you just go back to hell. Christ has redeemed me. He redeemed Luther. He redeemed you. He redeemed me. And he offers us his word and his absolution this morning to assure us of our redemption. So let that humility grow in your life as we follow our Lord who endured those downward steps of his, his humili humiliation just for each one of us. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.